What happens if you take some leaves of your beloved Canadian crowberry plant, give them a good scrub and incubate them on your favorite mix of potato and sugar? Introducing Ketomium globosum, a fungus which despite its disgusting appearance produces molecular miracles that would make any magic mushroom jealous. You see, if you ferment your globosum boy for two weeks in 10 liters of that potato water, you get enough organic material to run many, many extractions and separations and ultimately find 9 milligrams of this beautiful molecule. It only has oxygen, carbon and hydrogen atoms, but they're arranged in a cool cage-like architecture. Could this gem revolutionize how we treat cancer or inflammation, I hear you ask. Natural products are definitely not created equal. Some become breast cancer drugs, others only manage to make lettuce seedlings slightly uncomfortable. Well, our molecule in question is basically a pretty diva that's all show and no go. It seems to have zero activity. Given it cannot harm even salad, the only purpose of its existence is to attract the interest of try-hard synthetic chemists who get a tingly feeling when they hear the phrase eight contiguous stereocenters. Maybe on its best day, this molecule will just crush the GPA of poor souls who were foolish enough to actually take the exam of their university's total synthesis course. If you are that poor chemistry student or just a motivated nerd, I have some good news for you. This diva did attract the attention of chemists, but not just any ordinary ones. These guys speed ran its synthesis and delivered an educational piece of art that any chemistry student can digest, given it has few and relatively simple chemical reactions. We're going to cover the full range of seemingly easy transformations like SN2 to stereoselective cascade reactions. So no matter who you are, you're going to learn something today. Before blindly reviewing reactions, we first need to think about the retrosynthetic logic. So working backwards from our final molecule, where the first disconnection corresponds to the last synthetic step in the forward sense. There are of course many possibilities of making any complex molecule. If you're an advanced student, you might want to stop the video and have a go yourself. Obviously, we shouldn't start randomly snipping away at methyl groups. The core feature of this molecule are the ether bonds, so those should be our core focus. The one here was disconnected first, given its proximity to the secondary alcohol. We'll see why in a moment. The easiest reaction to create an ether is a simple substitution. So let's just go with that and introduce a leaving group like a bromide. What's so nice about having this next to our secondary alcohol? Well, if we imagine that it is made by reducing the ketone, we enable a simple way of introducing the bromide at the alpha position by going through the enolate. This ketone intermediate completely unlocks the synthesis because its natural or inherent polarity allows us to use simple reactions to construct two ring bridges. What do I mean? Well, the resulting motif is a beta hydroxy ketone. If we break the connecting bond into a nucleophile and electrophile, we see that it's simply an enolate attacking a ketone, so an aldol reaction. The only question is why our lower ketone would attack the upper one and not vice versa. We can solve this by redirecting our focus to the ether bond. The most logical disconnection here would suggest an oxygen nucleophile and a carbon electrophile. And again, this works perfectly with the polarity of an unsaturated ketone, given it is electrophilic at the beta carbon. This is nothing else than a Michael or 1,4 addition. In the forward direction, this aligns nicely with our aldol reaction because the Michael addition would generate an enolate, so the two reactions might happen in one step through a cascade or domino reaction. You see, you really can't go wrong with using carbonyls in your synthesis. Needless to say, it's unclear if any of this would actually work, but this shouldn't bother us for theory or exams. Experimental chemistry is a different story. No one cares if you have a fancy schmancy synthetic approach if you cannot make it work. In real life, you need to follow the will and preferences of your molecules. This results in annoying detours or if the stars align, as in this case, some really efficient and impressive work. I also wanted to highlight the introduction of our ketone. 
the electrophile of the aldol reaction. A minute ago we mentioned that the Michael addition is compatible with the natural polarity of the unsaturated ketone. On the other hand, this gamma hydroxy ketone is a trickier disconnection. The most logical approach would be a nucleophilic addition of an alkyl anion to a ketone. But beware, if we would generate this nucleophile, it would simply react with itself because it has both a nucleophilic and an electrophilic part. This undesired side reaction is why the ketone needs to be protected prior to Grignard reagent generation, for instance as the acetal. But there's another issue. We not only have to watch out for nuanced reactivity of the Grignard reagent with itself, but also nuanced reactivity with our substrate. We have another ketone present in the molecule, so we would see competing 1,2 and a little bit of 1,4 addition of the nucleophile on the other side. We can temporarily mask this moiety, for example by having a protected enol ether and a hydroxy group in the beta position which we can eliminate after we reveal the ketone function at some point. This compound has a 1,5 dicarbonyl motif and this is another handy keying element. We can break the connection of the two rings through another Michael addition. An enolate or enol ether nucleophile would attack the unsaturated ketone and if we would trap the enolate product, we would immediately mask the ketone to allow for a selective Grignard addition as we just mentioned. We haven't mentioned stereochemistry yet to keep things digestible, but note that this is an enantioselective synthesis. So we are making one specific natural enantiomer of the molecule. If we assume that all stereocenters are set perfectly throughout the synthesis, we only need to worry about starting with the enantiopure chiral 5-membered ring here. Note that our 4-membered ring is not a chiral molecule, so there's no issue of enantioselectivity to solve for here. We've now broken down our complex target, so let's dive into the forward synthesis to check out if and how this actually works. We'll start with the 5-membered ring. Our very first reaction is the transformation of cyclopentadiene to the cis-diol in just one laboratory step. Any ideas? Given we start with a diene and we have a single shifted alkene in the product, it looks like there's a cycloaddition of some sorts. We're also adding two oxygen atoms, so the answer is straightforward. By using activated singlet oxygen, a 4 plus 2 addition delivers an endo peroxide where both new CO bonds face the same direction. To get to the diol, we just need to cleave the weakened oxygen oxygen bond, and this can be done by addition of thiourea. Nucleophilic addition to one of the oxygens breaks down the peroxide, and because we run the reaction in methanol, there are plenty of hydroxyl groups in our solution that can exchange the thiourea and release the diol. Although this molecule has two stereocenters, it is not chiral due to the presence of a mirror plane. These are called meso compounds. The next four steps break this symmetry and already deliver our advanced 5-membered ring intermediate. Again, feel free to think about this yourself. The first step is actually biochemistry using a so-called lipase. These are enzymes that catalyze the hydrolysis of ester bonds. By adding excess vinyl acetate, we get a mesodiacetyl compound. The enzyme is chiral itself. So simply put, it only wants to hydrolyze one of the alcohols. This breaks the symmetry, liberating the free hydroxyl group while leaving one acetyl group untouched. In the second step, this hydroxyl is protected as the TBS ether. Remember that this is the group that we want to eliminate later on to enable our domino reaction. The steps number 3 and 4 are deprotection of the acetate and oxidation to the ketone completing our Michael acceptor. By the way, if you like solving organic and medicinal chemistry questions, feel free to check out the exercises on my website. I'll try to add more in future, but if you haven't seen these yet, feel free to take a look. The synthesis of our four-membered ring also has a nice reaction. We actually start from a cyclopropanol. By adding some acid, we generate a carbocation that triggers a 1-2 shift expanding the ring. This is a form of a semi-pinnacle rearrangement. 
because we want to have a nucleophilic form of this ketone for our first Michael addition, we formed a silyl enol ether with some base and TBS chloride. This starting material allows for a Mukayama Michael addition, where a silyl triflate activates the enone for nucleophilic addition to connect our rings. The mechanism is obviously not concerted, but I just abbreviated it here. There are two important highlights. First of all, the reaction seemed to be a bit of a pain in the ass. You might know that Mukayama additions often use Lewis acids like titanium chloride and the chemists had to try hard to find workable conditions. They even tried antimony Lewis acids before they realized that only triethylsilyl or tributylsilyl were productive but only at a sweet spot of minus 40 degrees. At minus 78 there was no conversion at all. The second interesting point is that from four possible diastereomers they only found two being formed in a 4 to 1 mixture. Later on they figured out that the major one is the upper one here and the minor one differs at the alpha position of the cyclobutane. This is intriguing because for both of these diastereomers the addition to the olefin is happening from the side that would seem to be shielded by the bulky TBS group if we were just considering simple sterics of the starting material. You might think Gee, that's very surprising. Though it's not really, because the same finding was documented three decades ago by the famous Daniszewski and co-workers working on prostaglandin natural products. They had worked with the same Michael acceptor and found that organometallic nucleophiles lead to anti-addition, while enol ether nucleophiles give a syn preference instead. So why does this happen? You guessed it, it's complex. Daniszewski leveraged the g plug model which had been proposed some years earlier to explain anomalies in diastereoselective reactions. If I remember it correctly, it's based on the hyperconjugation of adjacent bonds that stabilize the developing sigma star orbital of the new bond between our nucleophile and the electrophilic carbon. The logic is that you'd rather want a CH sigma bond next to it because CH is a better sigma electron donor than a CO bond. But it doesn't matter because the model has been disputed since its inception. There are computational findings that suggest the selectivity can be explained by electrostatics and torsional effects alone. So factors which you cannot visualize or immediately explain in freestyle as organic chemistry professors would like you to when explaining selectivities. I said the synthesis would be simple to understand, so I kinda broke my promise, but that's chemistry for you. Don't believe the promises that you will be guaranteed a job after your degree either. On the bright side, we can easily explain the diastereoselectivity at the cyclobutane with steric factors. The enol ether attacks in such a way that places the dimethyl away from the action, as opposed to having them inside of the ring, as shown here. So next we throw our Grignard reagent on our mix of diastereomers and after that reaction add some acid to reveal the masked ketone on the side chain. This conveniently also reveals the ketone in the ring. For this addition the diastereoselectivity is much more obvious as the new bond is trans or opposite to the large cyclopentyl rest. I first didn't want to even render a 3D model for this one but then I decided to be extra cute and show you the van der Waals radii. This should give you some appreciation for the general bulky nature of silyl groups and it also visualizes that there's simply more stuff on the bottom face of the ketone because that's where the cyclopentyl ring is located. Now we're almost ready for action. First the tertiary alcohol that was formed by the Grignard addition was acetylated to shield it. By cooking things up with acid for half a day, the TBS group gets deprotected and the free hydroxyl group gets eliminated, giving us our Michael acceptor. Finally, the domino reaction conditions are like a never ending shopping list, but still, there is one major product being formed in 55% yield. Asking for a mechanism here is quite devilish, but we did review the retrosynthesis already, so maybe you can rewind and try to figure out where we end up after all of this and how. 
This is our Michael Aldol cascade and then some. You should check out the paper to understand how they ended up with this approach. In short, the methoxide base releases the free alcohol, which attacks the enone in Michael style and the enolate closes up with the ketone of the sidechain as we had predicted. They had to do some trickery by using excess base and trapping the dianine with a silyl chelate to avoid having the reaction go backwards again. Remember, chemical reactions go both ways. The last two sub-steps prepare the final ring closure of the total synthesis. First, addition of the electrophilic bromide source DBDMH installs the leaving group that we need for our SN2 reaction. By the way, the bromide is added from the less hindered side. Then, the protection of the silyl ether liberates the free hydroxyl group that will displace the bromide in this very SN2 reaction. This seems extremely complex and you might think that the chemists tried to be extra cool and simply save the step count by doing all of these things at once. But when they isolated the aldol product, all attempts at bromination resulted in decomposition. So the quadruple reaction is actually useful and needed and quite remarkable. Also remarkable is the fact that the chemists didn't rage quit while trying to optimize this. The experimental procedure reads like a recipe to go mad. Quick, add the triethylamine, but immediately follow it up with the silyl chloride. Oh, and after a color change, immediately take it out of the cooling bath. And then continue with more shenanigans. You might find it interesting, inspiring, or maybe it gives you PTSD flashbacks. I'm more in the latter category and just happy that I can read about this and don't have to optimize it myself. To top it all off, the product is highly unstable and you have to speed run a very quick column chromatography. These chemists are clearly legends. As a consolation prize, the product can also be recrystallized and it does have a nice x-ray structure. We can clearly see a hydrogen bond here between the tertiary alcohol and the ketone. We have two final steps left, but we are not done learning. You will remember one of our first retrosynthetic moves was to assume that we can make the hydroxyl group from the ketone, thereby unlocking our domino reaction drama. We can do this with a reduction, but we want selectivity for the axial product. The clever solution is to exploit the position of the tertiary alcohol because it's oriented on the side that we want to deliver the hydrogen from. By using triacetoxyborohydride, we can use that alcohol to direct the reduction. It would be boring if you could work with your product like a normal human being, so it turns out that it's again highly unstable during purification. So better rush to our final SN2 reaction, but don't let your guard down. It proved essential to use a weak, sterically hindered pyridine base to achieve this ring closure. There's a last educational gem in this step. In this table, you can see that other conditions led to two undesired products, 22 and 18. Can you figure out how they are formed? It looks like we are losing the bromide and shifting a hydrogen around. This has to be our good friend from the very start, the semi-pinnacle rearrangement. If the secondary alcohol gets deprotonated instead of the tertiary one, it might trigger a migration of the hydride, kicking out our leaving group. This beta hydroxy ketone is now again prone to quote unquote go the other way, meaning that it will reverse the aldol reaction to break up the ring, giving us compound 18. This does not seem to be the case for this pyridine base, so they fortunately completed their total synthesis. Although this still ended up a long video with all the explanations, the synthesis itself is very short for such a target. Also, these guys made 60 milligrams of it. This is a truckload equivalent in natural products, because most synthesis campaigns end up with low single digit milligrams. It's actually a bit sad that this molecule doesn't have any real activity, because you can do some interesting stuff with 60 milligrams of material. But who knows? Maybe the chemistries developed here will prove useful for other efforts in future. That's it for this video. I hope you're now a bigger fan of non-magic mushrooms and hope that you learned something about chemistry. Feel free to like, subscribe and share with your friends if you have any. And I hope to catch you in the next one. All the best and take care.